Last week, we talked about the Enlightenment, and I said that this week we were going to talk about the Great Awakening. But before we can talk about the Great Awakening, we have to talk about one of the most known, and at the same time unknown, events that took place in the Americas during this time period, the Salem Witch Trials. Welcome back to Church History. I'm your host, Laura Lee Siemens. Before we jump into today's episode, I want to update you on where I am with the book series, Church History. The first book is going to be called The Church is Born, and it's going to cover the time period from the intertestimonial period all the way to Constantine. Each chapter is based on the first few episodes from this podcast. Of course, there will be more information in each chapter than was in each episode of our podcast. When I look for church history books, and I have a few sitting here on my desk right now, they're very hard to read and not the type of book you just sit down with a nice cup of tea and read. My book is going to be more of the second kind of book, the not too difficult to read, full of stories that every Christian should know. So where am I right now? Well, it is all written and I'm in the adding and fixing stage. I also have a great artist who's going to do some artwork for me and I'm really excited about that. I'll give you another update again next week. So today's episode. We're supposed to talk about the Great Awakening this week. As I was writing the episode for the Great Awakening, I realized I couldn't talk about the Great Awakening without talking about the event that happened in the Americas that caused people to not trust the church, especially when the church talked about the devil. This event has become known as the Salem Witch Trials. In 1953, Joseph McCarthy was afraid that communists were taking over the government, the schools, and basically everything controlled by the elites of society. So, he began to try to find as many communists as possible and put them on trial. A man named Arthur Miller wrote a play to try to show the similarities between the McCarthy trials and the trials from an event from the past, the Salem Witch Trials. The play Arthur Miller wrote was called The Crucible. It became a play, a movie, a TV show, even a musical. Before the play The Crucible, most people didn't know about the Salem Witch Trials. And now, our knowledge of the trials comes mostly from the play, written in 1953, then from actual historical documents. The play, remember, had a message that had nothing to do with witches. The message was to stop the trials searching for communists in America. So to make sure everyone really hated the witch trials, all the victims were young, beautiful teenage girls, and the church was the villain. The problem with painting history in a certain light instead of telling the whole truth in the context is that the viewer doesn't learn the lesson that history could teach them. When we see the whole picture and all the context, and allow ourselves to see the villains as human beings with emotions and fears, then we might end up even siding with the villains if we had been there during that time period. Or perhaps we may have disagreed with them, but have remained silent. Here are some basic facts from the trials. Over 200 people were accused. 20 people were killed and two dogs. Both men and women were tried and killed for being witches, old and young, rich and poor. What about the idea that it was the church's fault? Well, well well-known and respected church leaders came to the trials to testify and to try and stop the trials and stop the executions. And two of these respected church leaders did stop the trials and convinced the governor to make sure the madness stopped. Without those two church leaders, many more people would have died, probably most of the 200 people who were accused. Nobody was burned to death. Those killed were hanged, except for one 80-year-old man who was killed by pressing. Some of the deaths were not actually executions, but people who died in prison. So the picture of the church burning young teenage girls is simply not accurate. We also sometimes hear this story and we have this idea that the people were afraid of something make-believe, like they were afraid of unicorns or leprechauns coming to get them. 
they were afraid of demons. And today, in our churches, we don't talk about demons or about satanic forces. But Jesus did. He talked about it and encountered it. Luke chapter 11, verse 14 says, And he was casting out a demon, and it was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed. Matthew 8.16 says, When the evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were ill. Mark 1.34 And he healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. Luke chapter 4 verse 41 Demons also were coming out of many shouting, You are the Son of God. But rebuking them, he would not allow them to speak, because they knew him to be the Christ. Mark chapter 1 verse 39 And he went into their synagogues throughout all of Galilee, preaching and casting out the demons. Luke chapter 13 verse 32 And he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow. And the third day I reach my goal. Luke chapter 4 verse 35 But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in the midst of the people, he came out of him without doing any more harm. Before we can tell you the story of the witch trials, I have to tell you a story that happened 22 years earlier in a nearby town. In 1671. Elizabeth Knapp was a young girl who lived in the Massachusetts Bay Company area. She had a job working for the local preacher, and she was his servant. The preacher's name was Samuel Willard. Pastor Samuel Willard was the kind of preacher who didn't shy away from talking about the devil. One Sunday, he preached a powerful message about staying far away from anything that had to do with demons and Satan. A quote from his sermon is this, Although God is ready to receive you, the devil is ready to devour you. On Monday, October 30th, 1671, Elizabeth suddenly started screaming uncontrollably. She rocked back and forth, and when she spoke, it was in a voice that was not hers. Her mother asked Pastor Samuel Willard for help. He spoke to Elizabeth, who told him that a neighbor had come through a chimney and put a spell on her. The pastor did not believe her and told her she was the problem, not to the neighbor. The behavior continued on and off. At one time, Elizabeth tried to throw herself into a fire during one of these episodes, and it took both of her parents to hold her down and keep her safe. Some of these episodes lasted for hours and hours, some up to over 24 hours. And during these episodes, she talked with a different voice and had strength that was not normal for a young teenage girl. Elizabeth's parents and the pastor kept her in her own home. They didn't allow her in town for two reasons. One, to protect the town, but also to protect her. The pastor's goal was to help Elizabeth and to free her from whatever was affecting her. Pastor Willard looked for medical reasons for Elizabeth's sudden change in behavior. There simply was no medical reason. There was no answer except for demonic forces. With prayer and Bible reading, it seemed that Elizabeth was getting better. One day, her parents allowed her to leave the house for a short walk around the town. They knew that for her recovery and for her to be healthy, she needed fresh air and exercise. They understood that staying locked up in her home would only make things worse. On January the 12th, 1672, Elizabeth walked to the home of Pastor Willard. There were other people visiting the pastor's home that day. Elizabeth had not had an episode in quite a while. She was standing among the other visitors in the home when suddenly she stood up on the very tips of her toes. Her eyes rolled back into her head and she began to scream. Then her voice changed into a voice that was not hers. Pastor Willard and the other visitors circled around Elizabeth. Pastor Willard began to pray loudly in Jesus' name, commanding the demon to leave. Pastor Willard would not stop praying and crying out in Jesus' name until suddenly Elizabeth dropped to the ground. That was the last time Elizabeth had an episode like that. She never again had the strength or the voice that she had had during one of those episodes. 
A few years later, she was married. She became a mother, and she lived a completely normal life. Pastor Willard wrote about what had happened, and he never dealt with anything like that before, and he never had a situation like that again. But he would be called to testify in a court case 22 years later in a small town nearby, the town Salem. Over the last few months, we have talked about this area of Massachusetts. In 1625, the town of Salem was started by some fishermen. The people of Salem had traveled with John Withrop when King James I had tried to get rid of his enemies, and the English war was brewing and about to start. Life was really hard. 200 people died, including John Withrop's own son. Almost 100 people had returned to England because life was just too harsh. A Category 4 hurricane had wiped out the crops and destroyed the homes, leaving people dead. Within a few years of arriving, almost half of the people who had come were dead. It was the year 1692 when our story starts. The leaders of the town were the children of those who had arrived with Winthrop. Their lives were run by fear, real and rational fear. Disease, wild animals, storms, and wars were all fears. The town of Salem had become a harbor for refugees fleeing the war between the English and the French. The village was on the edge of a great land that no one knew or understood. At this point, remember, the area had not been mapped out. No one knew how big it was or what was out there. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, Jesus said, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. For the Puritans living on the edge of this great land, they believed they were bringing the gospel to the end of the world, and that meant that Jesus' return was very soon. They also saw this as a spiritual battle. If Jesus' return was soon, and their act of bringing the gospel to this land would bring the return of Jesus, Satan would certainly be angry about that, and he would attack them and try to stop them. The storms, the sickness, the war, even the fighting amongst the villagers were all from the devil, trying to stop them from the great task God had given them. That was the context from where our story starts. The pastor in this town was named Samuel Paris. His daughter, nine-year-old Elizabeth, and his 11-year-old niece, Abigail, began to have episodes of screaming and shaking, similar to what had happened to Elizabeth Knapp 22 years before. Samuel did what every father and loving uncle would do. He brought the girls to the town doctor to try to help them. Was this a new disease? One more thing for the town to fight? It was the town doctor named William Griggs that gave an official medical diagnosis of bewitchment. It was the town doctor who said, there must be a witch in the area that's put a spell on the two girls. It was the doctor who started the idea of the problem being witchcraft. Soon, more little girls started having the same symptoms. Anne Putnam, Mercy Lewis, Elizabeth Hubbard, Mary Wolcott, and Mary Warren. This all happened in January of 1692. Parents started to panic. They had to fear weather, disease, war, the wilderness of this country they lived in, and now witches? Fear is a powerful tool because people will do things they would never normally do when they are controlled by fear. And why would they not be afraid? There were now eight little girls who were having these screaming fits, and the town doctor and the town preacher were telling them that it was witchcraft. So why would they not believe them? The preacher had a Caribbean slave named Didbu, and she was arrested for being a witch. Soon after that, a homeless woman named Sarah Good was arrested, and then an elderly woman named Sarah. Jonathan Corwin and Jonathan Hathorn were the town magistrates. They questioned the woman, and Didbu tried to find a way to free herself. She was told if she gave up the names of the other witches in town, she would be free, so she named more people. She claimed that the devil was trying to stop the work the Puritans were doing in this new land. So the town people, they had girls who were acting uncontrollably, 
They had the town doctor and the town preacher telling them it was witchcraft. And they had a woman who was now saying she was a witch and that there were more witches and that the devil had sent them to stop the Puritans. So if you were living in this town, if you had a young daughter, would you have been caught up in the fear? Ask yourselves, if doctors told you to be afraid of some kind of unknown thing that was going to get you, would you believe them? Especially if all the elites in town were believing them? Would you make choices to keep your family safe, even if those choices meant destroying the lives of other people? Ask yourself that question honestly in this year of 2021, before you lay judges at the people in this town. Some of the women at Tibitu claimed were witches, also confessed and accused more people. There was an idea that if you gave up the names of other witches, then maybe you would be set free. That idea meant a lot of people were being accused. The trial started May 1692. The judges were Hathorne, Seawall, and Strockton. On June 2nd, the first person was found guilty, Bridget Bishop, and eight days later, she was hanged. That month, five more people were found guilty, and the next month, five more, and eight more the month after that. 18 people in just three months. One of those people was a man named Giles Corey. He was 80 years old. He was killed by having heavy things pushed down on his chest. There were also seven people who died while they were being held in prison. Two dogs were also accused of being controlled by witches, and they were killed. Over 200 people were accused of being witches. So in total, over a three-month time period, 23 people died. 17 hung, one crushed, and seven died while in prison. 30% of the people who died were men. 70% were women. While Pastor Paris was the main part of the trial, to blame the church is historically inaccurate. Do you remember Pastor Samuel Willard, who dealt with Elizabeth Knapp? Well, he came to town and testified in the court. He told the court what happened with Elizabeth Knapp and that it was prayer that freed her. He said she had told him it was a neighbor, but the actual problem had been her, not the neighbor. He begged the court to stop what they were doing, and he tried to save the people. Pastor Willard could see what was happening, and that it was out of control. Another pastor named Cotton Mather also heard what was happening, and he knew that it had to stop. His father was the president of Harvard College. At the time, Harvard was a university that the Puritans had set up to train preachers. Both Mather men realized what was going on in Salem had to end immediately. When they visited the court, they realized that the court was taking dreams as proof and allowing it as testimony. This was simply not legal, so they appealed to the courts to have any evidence based on dreams to be thrown out. They also appeared to the governor for help. The governor said no dreams could be part of the testimony. Slowly, the people in the town began to think for themselves. People who were against the trials, but too afraid to say anything because they didn't want to be called a witch themselves, slowly began to speak out. And hearing people speak out gave courage to others who were not feeling good about the trials. And soon the mood switched. The trials stopped and the people being held in prison were released. The governor gave a full pardon to everyone involved. The little girls eventually got better. And some people believe there might have been a bad crop that year. Today we know that a disease grown on wheat can give people the same symptoms as taking LSD. And perhaps... That was the problem that the girls had. In 1711, the government paid the families of the people who died during the trial, and their names were cleared of any wrongdoings. In 1703, nine years after the trial, a little baby boy was born. His name was Jonathan Edwards. And in our next episode, we talk about the Great Awakening. He will be one of our main characters. After the trials ended, people realized the huge mistake that had happened. They realized, not just this trial, but the many that had happened in Europe over the last few hundred years were wrong. They were sick of the fighting between the Catholics and the Protestants. They were sick of the whole thing. And there was this new idea being floated around, the idea of deism, 
that God created the world and then just walked away and that we can do what we want as long as we're kind and treat other people with respect. God and the church just didn't have to be the center of their lives anymore. That was the idea of the Enlightenment. The church began to say that as long as you're a member of the church, that's all that really matters. Within just one generation, the church changed completely. The church was empty, the tavern was full, and the men in the pulpit were just there for a career choice, not there for a mission. In fact, it was questionable if they were converted themselves. And when a preacher began to preach about hell and about the devil, there were a lot of people who refused to listen. That was the sermon of their parents and their grandparents, and they didn't want that in their church. To hear about that preacher who is preaching about hell and about the devil, you'll have to come back next week, where I promise I will talk about the Great Awakening. One of the podcasts that I love is the Revised Thoughts podcast, and in that podcast, they normally have a sermon from church history that they like to recreate. They have an episode on the story of Elizabeth Knapp that I recommend, and I'm going to put a link to that in the show notes. In the meantime, for more podcasts, blogs, and videos, check out my website, lauraleesiemens.com, and I'll see you next week.